Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. Who came up with the idea that you go to a two-day class and you're qualified to do this work? Dan, you and I have known each other for, I don't know, six, seven years maybe. Um, and uh, I think I know who Dan Mezek is, but uh, how would you introduce Daniel Mezek? Um, Daniel Mezek is a guy who um, came up through technology and IT uh, professionally. Uh, raised four kids along the way with the, the same girl and um, now is focused on the organizational change side of sociology and trying to, trying to actually bring some progress to that domain, uh, specifically in the or organizational change space. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also a guy that's uh, continuing to learn guitar a uh, guy that likes to kayak when the sun's going down. Uh, and I, I like to drink beer. Nice. What kind yeah. of beer? Uh, generally IPAs with, with more than 7% alcohol. <laughs> That's my yeah. kind of beer, yeah? Yeah. And um, I'm also an avid reader, so I always have a couple books going at any given time that I'm, that I'm uh, working through. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a little bit of a... I would say um, contrarian, a little bit of a troublemaker. Troublemaker, yeah. yeah. A little bit of a troublemaker. So I'm happy. I'm happy in that in that role. You know, it's part of my part of my uh, persona. What got you into the organizational design or organizational change? Well, what happened was in the '90s, I had a I had a technical uh, training and consulting firm during the whole peak of the boom there that led up to the dot bomb crash in the year 2K fiasco. Mm -hmm. So the whole 10 years leading up to that, I ran a consulting firm, and we did training, you know. And uh, so I have a software de uh, engineering degree, and um, that business materially changed around 2003 or so. So from 2003 to about 2006, um, I was, you know, doing well financially and everything, but didn't really know what was next. You know, um, the previous business, uh, which was uh, at one time a happy hunting ground, uh, was now somewhat, uh, the game was somewhat scarce. Mm -hmm. uh, and it had changed. The game, the game of, uh, of uh, you know, staffing had changed. So I didn't know quite what I was doing. And then in 2006, um, I started poking around and went to a, a CSM class that was run by a guy named Lowell Lindstrom. And that what was, was this in Chicago. Boston or? It was in Chicago. I think there were six Chicago. people at the thing. It was in Chicago at a hotel. <laughs> and that, that began my journey through Scrum Agile organizational change. And I've been at it ever mm -hmm. since. Nice. So what do you think, what are your thoughts on the current state? There's so much going on and uh, in, a day, in the Agile community. What are your thoughts on the current state of Agile? What, what dimension? I mean, there's so many dimensions. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's look at the dimension of certifications. What, 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 are, what is your thought on the current state? Obviously taking that CSM class years ago. Uh, what it meant then, what it means today. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So from my point of view, you know, um, I mean, I don't, I don't hold the CSM credential anymore. Okay. Let's put it that way. And then let me talk a little bit about certification in general. Okay. So if we look at the concept of certification, just, just by itself uh, as the, as a wide topic, uh, Milan, out, you know, beyond Agile, for example. Here's what we're finding out. This is, my, this is my take. There's been a complete uh, failure of the higher education system to deliver on its promises of a better life, a better economic life, a better future for you and your children. Uh, young people go into higher education today and then they, they're sold a bill of goods. There used to be a saying to get a good job, get a good education. 
Well, that might be true still, but the higher education system is not delivering on the good education. Uh, what they're doing is baptizing people into debt mm -hmm. and, um, you know, kind of running a scam. So what's happened is that has, that has imploded. And mm -hmm. in response, uh, self-organized response to this situation, we have the rise of certifications. So if you have seven to $9,000 and you got a year's, a year's time of, of yours, you can learn about an industry, enter the industry with, with a credential, go to a couple of conferences, meet some people, and you can enter that industry and begin, you know, um, um, becoming gainfully employed. One year, you know, 9000 bucks or so, you're in. Mm -hmm. That is a self-managed, self-organized response to the demise of higher education, in my opinion. Okay, mm -hmm. So within that context, we have the Agile certifications. Now, the Agile certifications are done quite poorly, actually. Uh, and that's part of the problem. So we hear people all over the world going, you know, who came up with the idea that you go to a two-day class and you're qualified to do this work, you know, and this kind of mm -hmm. thing. Well, of course, Ken Schwaber came up with that. But the reality is that the PMI actually pioneered this. And Ken mm -hmm. took their best ideas and tweaked them a little bit you know, and formed the Scrum Alliance. Um, a lot of people don't realize Ken Schwaber formed the Scrum Alliance. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Ken Schwaber was also in on the formation of Agile Alliance previous to the Scrum Alliance. Uh, so that's a whole other story. Let's stay on the certification uh, answer. Yeah. Certifications in the Agile world um, are proliferating because of what I already just said. What we need to do is we need to take some more cues from Ken Schwaber. Ken Schwaber has a couple things going on with the PSM, uh, Professional mm -hmm. Scrum Master, uh, and the whole range of certifications he offers through scrum.org. Number one, it's a lifetime cert. You don't have to renew. Okay, there is no renewal fee. You, you're, you earn the cert, it's lifetime. Second is you don't have to go to a class. You have to pass a rigorous exam. It's a good idea to go to the class, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. So these are a couple of changes to Ken brought in. Um, how much did that, what do you think, uh, maybe we're going off topic here, but how much did that have to do with uh, differentiating from Scrum Alliance um, to offer that type of yeah, sense? So like, you know, Scrum Alliance has its own, hey, you know, you have to attend two days. Uh, uh, what do you think? Did that have play any, or is it just more like maybe yeah, it's I'm lesson not, learned from Scrum Alliance? I'm not sure. What you should do is get Ken Schwaber on here and ask him that question. <laughs> that would be a I great idea. To, I'll help yeah. you. I'll help you get him on the show if you want. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, he's, that would he's be great. Quite, that, yeah. Yeah. He's quite a character. So, so here's the wider picture. Certifications aren't evil and they're not bad, but they have become part of a wider set of, I would say, concerning and alarming trends in the Agile industry, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, we have a lot of imposing of Agile practices going on throughout the world. Um, Well-intentioned but um, misinformed executives are led to believe through omission, because we don't tell them anything different, that they can just roll it out and everything's going to be great. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really believe that. And they've got, you know, when they've got budget authority for say three quarters of a million or a million dollars, um, it's going to be kind of hard to push back on that when they're ready to sign a check. Mm -hmm. So as a result, the whole agile industry looks the other way um, on the fact that imposing practices disengages people. And that's why it doesn't work. Right. How much? Uh, how much do you think it's part of the just th that process is uh, just part of a natural pathway? Because uh, I'm seeing more and more organizations that have gone through that imposing change, and leaders actually realizing what they've done. Now they're going back and saying, "Oh shit, <laughs> yeah, I know what but, I've done." Yeah, but here's the deal, right? Yeah. They've taken a tremendous financial haircut. Mm -hmm. That lesson has cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have done a serious disservice to the um, executive.
executive leaders, the decision makers, by not informing them of the probability of failure uh, with the quote unquote rollout um, of the quote unquote transformation, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a failing of the agile industry uh, and specifically the agile industry leadership who hasn't said a, <laughs> hasn't said a single thing uh, mm -hmm. about this issue. Uh, there's no statement of position you can find anywhere from Scrum Alliance, Agile Alliance, IC Agile, or any of these other other um, esteemed institutions. So we've got to get, we're going to have to fix it ourselves. Um, and the way that's done is by making sure executives are informed so they can give informed consent to the imposed mandated rollout. So they know what they're getting into and uh, the likelihood of failure and how much that failure is going to cost, right? So if we could turn the clock and act in the past, of course, no one can act in the past. Every executive that was ever uh, going to buy an agile transformation uh, would be informed of the probability of failure of, of various approaches and the probability of success of various approaches. And then they'd be asked to pick one. And then they they could then then they could own the probabilities. Um, you you're a coach. How long have you been coaching? How many years? Close to ten years. Ten years. So many times you have shown up after the smoke has cleared and all the coaches have left, and there's been one point one million spent. It's more, uh, and more it's more <laughs> more of a case right now than the, what it used to be. But yeah, yeah. So. When you show up and you see the damage that was done and you see the credibility of the whole thing being questioned, you know, obviously a serious disservice has been done to your profession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something we can, we can move towards uh, going forward. As far as certifications go, um, certifications provide credible proof that the person has made a um, investment of time, money, and attention in learning the craft. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I am pro certification. I think certifications are good. Um, and it's okay to have easygoing certifications at like the level one, mm -hmm. but um, those are just entry points and th th there should be much deeper learning uh, that's involved that takes more time and is involved with social learning with peers uh, yeah. instead of just taking a class and checking off a few boxes on a test. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, maybe just looking in a, a, I'm familiar with Scrum Alliance because I'm associated with that uh, organization, but like what Scrum Alliance has done with, uh, with CSP, CTC, um, where the bar is a lot higher now, if you want to be considered, um, a coach. So I don't know, uh, is that something uh, along the lines? Maybe it's not perfect, but I don't know how familiar you are with the Scrum Alliance's path to CSP and also the introduction in the last couple of years of a uh, certified team coach. Yeah, I like, I like that progression. If you look at any certification society or body or community, they start off fairly loose and well, only a few certifications that have a very low bar. And then over time, they add certifications, they raise the bar and so forth and so on. And that's what's going on with the Scrum Alliance. And of course, we saw the advent of the SEUs, you know, maybe, I don't know, five or seven years ago. And that's just a direct copy of the PMI. PMI. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, you know, all that's that, th that's good work that the Scrum Alliance is doing. Um, but as far as like the state of Agile today, um, a lot of dubious ethical things have been going on during their watch mm -hmm. and during, and also the Agile Alliance during their watch, a lot of bad things have happened. So for example, if we look at the Agile Australia keynote from Martin Fowler, he had some things to say about the state of Agile. In fact, mm -hmm. it was called the state of Agile. Have you read that essay? Uh, I don't think I have. I know what you're talking about, but I don't think I actually read it. Yeah. So, so let me, if, if, if I may, allow me to, um, to show you, um, let me read some quotes to you. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> this is all from Fowler 2018. 
there's actually a lot of disquiet, a lot of disappointment, and a lot of unhappiness in the air. The reality is troubling because much of what is done is fake Agile, regarding, disregarding completely Agile's values and principles. This is even worse than just pretending to do Agile. It's actually using the name of Agile against the basic principles. We should focus on fighting the habit of imposing process upon teams. And he goes on to say, uh, our challenge now is dealing with fake Agile. A lot of what is being pushed is being pushed in a way that, as I said, really goes against a lot of our principles. And yet what I'm hearing so much is the, quote, agile industrial complex imposing methods on people. And to me, that is an absolute travesty. I was going to say tragedy, but I think travesty is the better <laughs> word. Yeah. Now, these are direct quotes. I'm quoting them. And then, yeah. um, you know, so he said all those things. Now, the shocking thing about all of that is that he said those things in 2006, 12 years earlier, and the leadership in the agile industry just ignored him. Had nothing to say about his 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 statements there, and he's an agile manifesto signatory. So all of us collectively have allowed a lot of dilution and pollution to enter uh, our community, our industry, and our careers. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do a lot better. I mean, agile has agile had past tense had the potential to be world changing. So what do you think? What are the, what is something that's probably mostly misunderstood by agile uh, by the leadership? I guess because uh, a lot of this has to do with uh, you know uh, imposing change, as you say, and you talk a lot about inviting. So what do you think? What is something that people seem to misunderstand about the agile number one, leadership? Yes, the number one thing that most folks. Um, either misunderstand or are not emphasizing enough is the link between success with bringing change to an organization and the engagement of the people that are affected by the change. So without engagement, you have exactly zero chance of, mm -hmm. of being successful. If those folks don't engage, there is no way that you're going to be able to be successful. So I'm going to read a quote to you. Um, now, here it is. It comes from Jeffrey Moore. He wrote the book uh, um, Zone to Win, and he's mm -hmm. can probably considered one of the greatest management consultants that are living today in the United States. Here's his quote. Transform now, he's not an agile guy, by the way. Okay, Here's what he says. Transformations cannot be accomplished without others helping voluntarily, and people don't help unless you engage them first. Okay, so that's the number one thing that's misunderstood in the agile industry today by coaches, by scrum masters. It's not in the, it's not in the teachings. It's not emphasized by the institutions. Everyone's looking the other way on this. You know, I want to tell you yeah. why. I have a theory about it. If we start talking about engagement and how it's essential for success, uh, for genuine and lasting uh, organizational change, then it begs the question, how do we engage the people? And nobody wants to go there in the agile industry. Mm -hmm. Why because, not? Well, it could be bad for business. Short term could or be, long term? Short term could be bad for business. Yeah. When we start talking about how to engage the people, first of all, if the transformation is dependent on anything at all, then it reduces the number of of, of sales opportunities, right? Because some places won't have the necessary things in place, right? So we want to just say, oh, it's all going to be great. It doesn't depend on anything. No, mm -hmm. that's simply not true. What it really depends on is engagement of the people that are affected because I want to, let's, can we talk, go a little deeper on this? All right, yeah. If you're my manager and you've got me by the performance review, which is typical in most companies, well, and I know that you're dragging your feet on this agile stuff that you don't like it. 
and there's 14 other people like me that report to you, you got 15 people, we're all picking up on your vibe. Okay. And because you've got us by the performance review, if you don't like Agile, I hate it. Okay. I mean, that's how it's going to go because you got me by the review and I'm working for you. And if you're a good manager, you know what? You've engendered some loyalty in me. You've, you've taught me how to trust you. So when you say something, I believe you, right? So even if I'm not afraid of you, even if I just really want to work for you, I'm supporting what you say. Loyalty. Yeah. 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 Like, like you, you've looked out for me over the past two or three years You've gone and you've defended me a couple of times, managers at your level and higher. You pulled my fat out of the fire a couple of times. And, and, and I, that's just made me just want to work for you constantly. And I, I, will, I will totally go as far as necessary to ach- help you achieve your goals because I trust you. Right. So that's one kind of management relationship. The other one is the fear-based one. Both of them are going to respond to your cues about agility. So if you don't like agility, I hate it. And other people who work for you hate it too. So, so every, we, we talk about engaging the people. We think about the teams. No, no. The managers, the directors, the other people that might be displaced by this agility stuff, they don't like it and they have direct reports. So there's this huge cascading effect. And now we can see why the agile uh, um, transformations fail because we we fail to engage the managers, directors, and everyone else who has a few questions. Mm-hmm. And they- I think those are the ones in, in my experience that are most confused. They don't know uh, what to do, and they don't have a lot of support as far as what to do. But a lot of times, they're the backbone of the organization. Uh, we're talk- right. they're talking to the teams as well as the senior leaders. That's right. Uh, so so yeah. that's the engagement angle, right? So that's the number one thing that's misunderstood and needs to be emphasized throughout the agile world is that unengaged people leads to epic fail. Mm-hmm. So you brought up Jeffrey, you brought up uh, Martin, you brought, brought up Ken. Uh, if you could have dinner with three people that are alive that had impact on what we call this, uh, what I call lean and agile moment, uh, who would it be? And uh, what kind of conversation would you have with them? Yeah, so the first two that I'd want to talk to, and I think they're both still alive, is the guys who wrote the new new product development game, the Nonaka and Takuchi, mm-hmm. the professors uh, in, in Japan who um, inspired uh, the naming of Scrum and a lot of the uh, concepts in Scrum. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the book, in the article, new new product development game, and some in some of their other articles. Um, they talked about something called uh, subtle control. And if you read the, their literature, they go, you know, sometimes this could be translated as control by love. I would control you know, by love by love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, the whole, their whole set of ideas, because they don't translate directly into English. I'd like to sit down with one or both of those guys and, and go through some of these papers that I read uh, from them mm-hmm. and, and, and listen carefully to how they uh, describe uh, what they actually mean a little deeper. I'd be interested in speaking with them because they had a profound right. impact on the world because they had a profound impact on Jeff Sutherland. Mm-hmm. Right. So a lot of that and later Jeff, uh, Jeff and Ken. So, these guys are world historical guys who don't get the credit they really deserve. Um, I'd like to speak with them. That's two. And then do you have questions on that before I go to the third one? No, it's just, uh, I remember reading, I don't know if it's them or somebody else, but coming back to the management and directors where they said uh, something around like 15 to 20% of those people or over the organization needs to uh, understand the whole process, the Kaizen uh, thinking. And uh, 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 as you were saying, and you brought up their names, uh, I was thinking like, yeah, I would love to, that, that's a great idea to actually, because a, a lot of it gets lost in translation and trying to get, um, get them to explain what they meant would be an awesome opportunity. So yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. And so who's the third person? 
Yeah, the third person. Um, well, before I go to the third person, let me just say um, that I, I I completely believe that um, those two gentlemen, Nonaka and uh, Takuchi, they understood fundamentally that the way to engage people is to give them um, give them uh, authorization to influence some of the decisions around the work that they'll be doing. Mm-hmm. That that deciding how to do your work and making decisions about the work um, is very engaging, and will build a tremendous uh, morale and enthusiasm mm-hmm. uh, for the work. I think they understood that implicitly. If you look at their writing, it's really clear. Yeah, and you talk about that a lot too, as far as like how authority is distributed and how important yes. that is. Yes. Uh, especially the authorization to decide, mm-hmm. right? So that's a very special kind of authority, uh, the authorized decision rights. That's actually the key to engagement. So I want to just make that point before I go to the third guy. So that's uh, all just to kind of, uh, uh, for my own curiosity, so that the decision right uh, is almost, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, not almost, but it's related to the autonomy, right? We want to completely related to autonomy. Yes, and let me go further and say that when we talk about self-organization, what we really mean is self-management in a in a business goal-seeking context. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, what is so what what when we talk about self-management, what's being managed is decision making. So if teams are not making enough decisions locally at their level of scope, Mm -hmm. um, they will never self-organize because they have no decisions that are important to make. So there's nothing to organize at all. So when we talk about self-management, we're really talking about the management of decisions that affect the group. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so it's self-organization and, and uh, what you call autonomy, uh, what I call authorized decision rights, those two things are highly correlated. You will get a lot of self-management and self-organization if people are authorized to decide mm-hmm. at their at their local level, you know, at the team mm-hmm. level, say. Okay, so this is like really really important. And um, the other thing about this is that we call people who have a strong need for control. We call them control freaks. But actually, if you read the psychological literature, here's what you find out. A satisfied need for control is associated with strong psychological health and resilience. Okay, so when people feel out of control, that's a recipe for depression. That's a recipe for uh, the opposite of well-being, right? When you feel good, you feel like, okay, I know where the levers are. You know, when, when I do this, the world does that, my world does that. And, and I know, I know how this thing works. Okay. And then there's a certain amount of mastery that's associated with that. And it makes you feel good. So this whole idea that we're going to get, you know, wonderful, virtuous, agile self-organization out of um, external decision-making is just a fairy tale. It's just a complete fairy tale. Right. So, I mean, I can tell you how I really feel about that. (laughs) <laughs> no. uh, so who's the third person third person is Deming Deming be, yeah. I, yeah Deming I want to talk to Deming and I want to ask him about human nature what he knows about human nature um, what motivates people what doesn't motivate people what engages them what doesn't engage them what are the basic human needs how does that play out in business I'd, I'd like to have that conversation with him because my sense is that he completely understood that stuff. I think so too. And that's one of the things that I see, um, at least when I talk to Scrum Masters and coaches, uh, they don't fully understand or even see the need to understand the psychology, the human side, the culture side. And uh, without that, you really, you don't see the, you know, half of the picture. Uh, so what are your thoughts? What would be your, um, I guess, uh, tip or recommendations uh, uh, <laughs> for uh, understanding the human nature and psychology. And I think people go to work to earn a living. 
And then they try to derive meaning from that work. And if I can't derive meaning from my work, then I'm going to go somewhere else where I can. <clears throat> right? So it's not enough just to make money. I also have to feel like I can understand what it means to be doing that work. So, you know, you've got some questions um, around culture and you and I have had many conversations around culture. Uh, I wrote this book in 2012 called The Culture Game. Mm -hmm. um, and I said some things in there um, about culture. That book, that book is not an org change book. It's a local optimization book. So if you're in a big company and you're never going to change the system, but you're a manager and you have budget, you have some higher fire authority, you convene meetings. This book will show you how to make things better in your little corner of the world and how to spread those ideas to other managers um, so that you can do local optimizations with them and make the world, the, your little corner of the world a little bit better. Since I wrote that book, which is uh, like nine years ago, I've come to realize something about culture and Scrum. And I'd like to share it with you now if, uh, if that's okay. Um, Scrum is a system of decision rights in three roles. We could think of it as an authority distribution schema. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you use Scrum, here's what you're doing. You're saying the way we make decisions around product and value creation isn't really working for us, or if it is working, we want it to work better. Mm -hmm. And we're going to set aside what we were doing before because we're not satisfied with the results and we're going to drop in scrum and we're going to use the scrum decision rights to produce more value faster with happier people. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the idea with scrum. So if you do really, really good scrum, the, the following, the thing I'm about to say is definitely true. If your scrum is good, very good or great, then you have fully, implemented the decision rights as described in the scrum guide okay so scrum is a system of decision rights in three roles and here's the secret of all the bad scrum that's going around you can do the full scrum without the decision rights all the roles all the events all the artifacts most of the rules but if you don't implement the decision rights you're still going to get a 10 to 15% improvement in everything you're measuring. Mm -hmm. And that's good enough for most companies. They're very happy with that. And Which is pretty sad. It's pretty sad, right? And, but here's the, but here's the, here's the kind of uh, odd, odd beauty of it. They don't really have to change anything about how decisions are made in the company to get that 10 or 15%. They just have to pay attention to the detail a little more. And that's what they're doing when they, when they do when they bring in scrum, we might call it scrum, but yeah. uh, you know, the scrum, but that we've always heard about for the past decade, all that is a scrum without the decision rights because the decision rights are the hardest thing to implement in scrum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now here's the next thing. And it relates to culture. I can change the culture of a corner of an organization or the entire organization in three days. Culture change is ridiculously simple. This is the thing I understand now, 11 years later after writing this book. Wow. Okay. And here's, here's the secret. All you have to do if you want to change the culture is change the way decisions are made and who makes them. That's all you have to do. Mm-hmm. It's not complex. So that's, a, the, so that's not necessarily even a structural change. It's a policy change. Oh, it's a structural change because it's it's yeah. how decisions it get forces, made. It forces, yeah. It forces who, structural change. Yeah. And who makes them. Yeah. Yeah. So if you bring in true scrum and you drop it in and the executives and everyone else agree to it and they and then when the boundaries are tested, you know, people, you know, everyone gets a talking to when they try to breach these boundaries and they look, don't breach that boundary. Mm -hmm. that's going to change your culture in three days. So structure or changing really systems, changing the systems and policies within the larger system is probably what you're talking about. Specifically the way decisions are made about value creation. Mm -hmm. 
So when you change the way decisions get made, the culture changes right away. That's been my experience. And now we know why there's so much crappy scrum going around because you have to change the way decisions get made if you're going to do good scrum. So, so you know, what, what I have going on now and what's exciting me now is um, something called the Open Leadership Network, openleadershipnetwork.com, where people can mm-hmm. learn about some core patterns, right? So I have a, I have a prediction. I think we're going to move away from practice frameworks and we're going to move towards a focus on patterns that power those practices. So patterns free us from the tyranny of practice frameworks, right? So a pattern that's like a pattern, for example, like um, leadership invitation or boundary management or explicit agreements. Those patterns can be implemented in many different ways in, with using many different kinds of practices, some of which mm-hmm. haven't even been invented yet. But if we focus on the patterns and then we make sure that the practice expresses the pattern, then that's a good practice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think we're at that point um, in organizational change. We're starting to realize the static nature of practice frameworks. Uh, it got us to a certain point, but now we need to embrace the, the, um, the customizing, the tailoring, the empirical nature of, of um, how organizational change is different in each, each company. And it's different mm-hmm. from time to time as they move through time, it changes. And the patterns are really the future, not, not practice frameworks. I agree. And recently I wrote about, uh, I used the analogy of cooks and chefs and following recipes. And I, saw uh, I, I talked about like how we can't just rely on recipes and these frameworks. Like we need to like step up our game, right? You can't just have, you know, cooks by the book blindly follow uh, recipes, but we need to have, uh, you know, more experienced cooks and chefs that, like you said, as time changes, we need to look at the patterns. We need to understand how ingredients interact with each other. So if I'm, throwing stuff in there, I know what kind of side effects it's going to uh, create. Yes. Um, so that means everybody will have to step up their game, which goes back to what you said about we can't just send people to two-day class and expect that they know a recipe. They actually have to develop themselves into good cooks and chefs so they can leverage these patterns. Yes. And- build essentially evolve their frameworks and practices based on the 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 need rather than blindly following these frameworks yeah i like that metaphor of of cooks and chefs and i want to add add to it now you know if we take like a restaurant or fine dining metaphor and you have you have a cook you know and then you have um you know a certain kind of um um patron sit down um patron needs to be advised about uh, about the meal, right? So if the meal has certain ingredients in it, they have to know to, in case they're allergic, right? Uh, they need to understand the level of spice that's going to be in the food or the cook needs to, you know, or the waiter needs to find out, you know, what level of spiciness do you like? You know, mm-hmm. this kind of thing. So, uh, and we all know a little bit of spice in food is great. Too much kills the whole meal, right? <laughs> so there's that. Right. So I think the biggest the biggest thing that could happen now to manifest progress in the org change space is imagine a world where every coach um, knew and understood and, and then executed on the idea that we need to educate the executive about the risks and rewards of various approaches Mm -hmm. that are, that range from pure command control delegation approaches, rollout and imposing. And at the other end, um, um, seeking voluntary uh, participation, uh, inviting people and seeing who the, who the, who the new leaders are putting those leaders in a spot where they're bringing the thing forward um, on behalf of the executive, sort of like the executive on the ground, and work with the willing people. That would be at the other extreme. So they executives need to understand this range of options from pure old school legacy command control all the way down to, um, you know, a purely invitational approach. And then all of the sort of uh, um, 
uh, it's the spectrum in between, mm-hmm. right? If we do that, then we're going to manifest real progress in the world. But that starts, doesn't that start uh, on the top of the organization with the board, with the, uh, uh, with the senior leaders? And uh, how much do you see that actually there's buying, there's that type of understanding at the right level of the organization, or essentially with that uh, authority level that you can change the fine, you know, how you budget, you can change your compensation policies and other policies. What are your thoughts on that? Well, if we, if we take a couple steps back from that, uh, and we look at the relationship between the, the consultant and, and the executive buyer, mm-hmm. the very first thing that needs to happen, in my opinion, is concerning like um, the implementation of Scrum. We need to sit down the entire leadership team and spend four to six hours with the whole leadership team where we're going to walk through some of the highly controversial uh, rules uh, and statements and decision rights that are described in the scrum guide and ask them if they really want to do this and explain what it takes to support what the, what the, um, what the issues, opportunities and risks are and make sure that they're really down to support scrum in their organization. Then they have a legitimate shot at doing something great. Until then, they're just shooting in the dark. They don't, they're not getting a full education. Um, I've done this lots of times with lots of executive teams, and I've, I've actually had executive teams just go, we, we just can't do this. That's, that's not right for our company. We're not ready yeah. for it. And that, you know what? They saved a whole bunch of money, and they, they, um, they also sidestepped a lot of harm to people. 